The Chinese government did not react to my research for the longest of times. For the obvious reason that doing so is very problematic because it could actually highlight the issue and give further evidence of the veracity of my findings. Hello, I'm Olivia Enos, Senior Policy Analyst in the Asian Studies Center at the Heritage Foundation, and I'm pleased to bring you our inaugural episode of China Uncovered, part of our broader China Transparency Project. The project and this series of podcasts are pushing for greater data-heavy transparency for the Chinese Communist Party by highlighting the work of our friends. We are kicking off our first episode today, talking about an issue near and dear to my heart, the crisis in Xinjiang. Some of the world's worst human rights violations are unfolding right before our very eyes. What started as speculation about the mass internment of the Uyghur Muslim minority in China has quickly turned into well-known fact that at least 1.8 million Uyghurs are currently held in political re-education facilities in Xinjiang. Satellite imagery, firsthand testimony, and Chinese government documents themselves attest to the existence of these camps reminiscent of horrors we thought were relegated to the history books. Revelations about these camps have surfaced in no small part due to the detailed intentional data collection and analysis of senior research fellow at the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, Adrian Zenz. Adrian's report cover a wide range of issues, including providing documentation for the existence of the political re-education camps in Xinjiang, documenting the police state and system of surveillance that now Xinjiang Party Secretary Chen Guangguo piloted in Tibet and transferred to Xinjiang that enabled massive collectivization, as well as uncovering Chinese government data that reveals the Chinese Communist Party's draconian family planning policies exacted against Uyghurs. Adrian, thank you for joining us today. I'm excited for our listeners to get to learn more from your expertise. Would you mind sharing some of the key findings of your more recent groundbreaking reports on the crisis in Xinjiang? Yeah, my most recent work was, of course, on birth prevention um, and sterilization and population control in Xinjiang, which uncovered um, the fact that the dramatic decline in natural population growth rates and birth rates in the Uyghur minority regions um, is not just to be attributed to the campaign of mass internment, whereby uh, many between possibly one and two million uh, Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities have been swept up in internment camps, but also that there is and has been a systematic state campaign to prevent births, to reduce population growth, um, in some instances, close to zero or even below zero. Yeah, those findings are really harrowing. And I know in your report, you mention, and I even draw upon in our own heritage reports, um, that some of this very systematic targeting of Uyghurs may even constitute some forms of atrocity crimes, whether genocide or crimes against humanity. Um, could you speak a little bit about that? Uh, yes, Um the findings on birth prevention, for the first time, quite specifically seem to be ticking one of the boxes of the United Nations um, Declaration for the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, namely the prevention of births of the targeted group. And um, that's really been ringing some alarm bells, because once you start to tinker with the physical population and population growth, then you really need to look into what kind of atrocity are we looking at here. Other, of course, uh, finding previous findings found that you know parents were being separated from children in state-run boarding schools or orphanages, uh, that many adults were being swept up in internment camps, which also had reports of people dying or being tortured, higher mortality, uh, and so on. You know, too often human rights research can feel somewhat anecdotal or even emotion driven. Your reports seem to really distinguish themselves from many others in the field because of your attention to detail and also your data driven methods. Um, you're covering a really highly emotional and heartbreaking subject and you're doing so with such care. Can you walk us through some of the methodologies of your reports and tell us why you decided to apply um, this method of analysis and the advantages of such a data-driven approach? 
I started out as an anthropologist doing some very detailed field work, which um, developed into interviews, which are then analyzed both qualitatively and quantitatively. And from that, I started a, a document-driven analysis approach that I looked systematically at, for example, public recruitment notices. Um, I looked at government statistics, government economic reports, population-related reports, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. When it came to Xinjiang, I started out by examining police recruitment and compiling statistics on on that development. But then, those documents are fairly straightforward to find and to analyze, even though it does take a lot of work. But as soon as there were the first reports of the campaign of mass internment and re-education camps, things became more complicated. Uh, this then required a different approach. You did not far have like the smoking gun statements, the obvious government uh, sort of documentary sources that said, we are doing this. The government was denying it. So then I had to take a different approach. I firstly ha felt I had to establish the, the terminology very clearly. How does the government speak about re-education? What are the key terms? Once I had established that, I then started to surround the topic by looking at evidence from different angles. This is an approach I also had to take, for example, with parent-child separation, because, again, there's not the one single smoking gun statement that says, look, we have all these children from parents who are both in detention, and we are now putting them in orphanages. I had to look at government propaganda, reading between the lines where it says, oh, look, we have these uh, wonderful study centers and both parents are studying, quote unquote, and the kids so that the parents can study undisturbed. The kids are in full full time uh, care in kindergartens, boarding kindergartens where they sleep and eat. So from these statements, from these sources, then you combine that with government statistics of preschool construction, of boarding school construction. You combine it with school policy documents that say, look, some students have parents in detention. We need to look, monitor them closely for psychological problems. So you approach a topic from five or six different angles. It's almost like a puzzle. I'm so glad that you're also drawing upon some of your other research and background, especially on the, you know, child and parent separation, which honestly is just such a heartbreaking issue. And I feel like your, your reporting really does um, shed a lot of light on that particular instance that I think so few people were really aware of until you had done your reporting on that. Um, one of the interesting things about your research is that so much of it is based on the Chinese government and data, as we were just talking about. And the data kind of speaks for itself. Um, have you found any challenges in engaging with the data from China? Or have you received any reactions from the Chinese government to your findings and the reports you produce? The Chinese government did not react to my research for the longest of times. Um, for the obvious reason that doing so is uh, very problematic because it could actually highlight the issue and <laughs> uh, give further evidence of uh, the veracity of my findings. You know, if they, if they said, oh, in this document, you misinterpreted this, and then other people might look at that document and go, oh, wow, <laughs> this is quite the incriminating document. So anyways, um, however, most recently, their strategy has changed uh, because of the, the sterilization findings uh, China is now being accused of genocide. There's talks about um, removing the Olympics from Beijing. And so the most sophisticated attack on my work came from a Xinjiang University uh, associate professor uh, who compiled a report attacking my findings. And she said, look, at this number is not right and, and that's not right. And there's this alternative explanation. And I'm actually about to publish a detailed rebuttal uh, of this um, because it's it's done under the guise of academic uh, rigor. Uh, and the South China Morning Post ended up uh, publishing this this critique of my work, not realizing it's basically pure window, window dressed propaganda, because once you closely look at it, it all falls apart. So anyways, I ended up writing an over 4000 word rebuttal, which I'm going to publish um, either tonight or, or in the coming days, probably. Um, so, the, and, and there, of course, what they, they were very careful. There's a lot of 
my uh, allegations that they did not address because they're way too sensitive for them. You know, the, steril the specific sterilization targets, they didn't say a thing about that because <laughs> they do not want to draw attention to these documents that they themselves have, of course, published. And also some of the, the birth rate declines, they, they try to really look at the numbers in isolation, uh, attacking one particular year's number. But as soon as you have a comparison of a couple of years back and you realize, wow, these numbers dropped very sharply. Uh, again, that is something that they have to be very careful about. So it's a very tricky it's very tricky for the Chinese to respond effectively to my research. Wow, that's really remarkable that you saw such a, you know, insistent response to your reports. I think it speaks to the strength of them and just how the data itself really is able to cut through any sort of obfuscation of the truth of the nature of what is going on there. And I, I think uh, we'll be happy to add into the uh, reading notes of the podcast for our listeners, um, the link to your response to that attack. But I think it's also incredible that the Chinese government is so afraid of the revelations that you're uncovering in your research, um, you know, that in some cases they're like pulling, I think you've mentioned before, pulling data um, down so it's no longer publicly available or even, you know, just basically getting people um, ready to respond to your reports. So that that's really remarkable and we'll keep an eye out for for your response as well. Um, shifting gears a little bit, when you first started your research, did you have expectations about the findings? Obviously, you've talked about a variety of different reports. Was there anything that really surprised you? And if so, uh, what was that? I think um, every single time I embarked on researching something that's quite challenging because it's being denied and there's not... Uh, really blatant, immediately accessible evidence. Every time I did that, I was quite shocked by how much I ended up finding and how powerful the final product ended up being, notably my first paper on the re-education camps. That was supposed to be like a, a maybe two and a half thousand word type uh, article trying to outline some of the basic evidence. It turned out to be uh, six times as long a fully-fledged academic paper. And um, also parent-child separation. Again, I started out just... Firstly, I, I, I declined and I said, look, uh, this is not possible, you know. Uh, we can't... There's not enough information on it. But then I uh, looked again and I saw these first propaganda findings. And then I said, okay, well... We can start to work on it, but <laughs> I ended up finding so much other data that it ended up being a very powerful piece. And again, with the birth prevention and sterilization, I never expected to find target figures for sterilization in weaker counties. I mean, that was just, I was absolutely shocked. So each time it developed to be much more than what it initially hoped to be. It was, you know, my, my paper on birth prevention was intended to be mainly just something very very mundane follow-up uh, on demographic figures. Well, that should be inspirational to others who are working in the field of human rights and those who are working specifically on Xinjiang, that if you um, are really intent on finding information and finding data, that it's there to be found. You just have to keep looking for it. So that's that's really great to hear. Um, are there any findings from your research that you wish received more attention? I would say my publication on forced labor has not received the attention in terms of just a clear analytical framework of how the coercive labor structures work and what the different policy programs are. Um, I regularly see mistakes being made in the media about uh, linking parts of forced labor to the internment camps where there's not such a link or not clearly distinguishing the different schemes or uh, not understanding the nature of the coercive nature of poverty alleviation, having to understand the systemic dimensions behind it. I think um, to some extent, the topic got a bit hijacked by, by others who succeeded in getting a lot more publicity, um, you know, which is, which is fine. But then I, I look at some of the other material and I don't see the conceptual clarity and, 
that actually is a problem because I think forced labor is the most important topic at the moment. And also, if we implement sanctions, we actually need to be quite careful what we base them on. I'm glad that you're focusing on the clarity and the accuracy there, especially I think as the forced labor issue is really coming into the public consciousness a little bit more. Um, So I think, yeah, uh, to our listeners, you should definitely check out um, Adrian's work on forced labor. And I believe if I remember correctly, you testified before Congress fairly recently on the issue of forced labor in Xinjiang. Um, So uh, listeners can check out that as well. Um, What makes your work so inspiring is that it really helps others who are focused on human rights realize that the data is ripe for cultivation. What issues related to the crisis in Xinjiang merit more research, and what are some aspects of the crisis that other researchers should consider delving into? Well, that's very interesting. For a while, I thought that, you know, there was more potential for satellite analysis, but then, of course, Most recently, we've had two major investigations by BuzzFeed and by the ASPI exactly on on satellite. Um, So I think, to be honest, the research on Xinjiang has by now become so comprehensive and covered so many areas. I think it's almost time to shift gears and look at some other areas such as Tibet, which, of course, I did manage to do a little bit most recently, but I'm not saying that we shouldn't look continue to look into Xinjiang. Um, I think there is more detail. But uh, at the same time, if you look the extent to which we now have in-depth empirical studies on Xinjiang, it's almost time to start looking at some other places. Yeah, I, I want to give you a chance just really briefly to um, you know, provide a, a short summary of your recent report on Tibet so our, our listeners who you know, may be interested in other issues in China could, could learn about that too, if you wouldn't mind. Yes. So I found that the uh, vocational training and uh, labor transfer scheme that had been developed in Xinjiang Um, is being replicated in the Tibet Autonomous Region. be interesting to see to what extent it is also now being found in some other Tibetan regions and other provinces, such as Qinghai, Sichuan, or Gansu, um, or indeed other minority regions. Um, The policy document, the key policy document here is from March 2019, which specified that all Tibetan nomads and farmers are to be subjected as part of poverty alleviation, are to be subjected to a militarized, a military drill style and closed management vocational training and labor transfer scheme aiming to train 600,000 Tibetan nomads and farmers in 2020, of which 50,000 are to be transferred to work destinations within Tibet outside of their home regions and at least 5,000 to other parts of China, other provinces. And a lot of the language is just identical or very similar to that in Xinjiang. So we now have a whole set, second set uh, scenario here. Of course, Tibet was the original place of inspiration for a lot of the security and police state tactics that were brought to Xinjiang. Since the uh, current party secretary of Xinjiang, Chen Chuan Guo, as you mentioned him, who oversaw the internment campaign and the police built up, he governed Tibet for five years and developed a lot of his techniques there. Um, Now we see kind of like a transfer back where something that has manifestly been pioneered and implemented in Xinjiang is being now implemented and per policy is mandated to cover the entire Tibetan autonomous region. It's amazing and really, I guess it shouldn't be shocking, but it is shocking to see how there's been kind of a back and forth between um, the Tibetans and and the residents in Xinjiang just experiencing the Chinese Communist Party really targeting them on both religious and ethnic grounds. Um, To conclude, I would just love to hear from you what action you would like to see in response to the findings of your reports. What are some of the most effective ways that you believe policymakers can make the best use of your data? Governments need to make atrocity determinations, uh, genocide determinations, That includes the United Nations and other multilateral bodies. Governments also need to move much stronger on denouncing, publicly denouncing the atrocity. And I'm here mostly speaking of uh, governments other than the United States who has done so. 
And uh, they also need to move very clearly, I think, on forced labor um, on, on various levels, both, you know, administrations, uh, legislations. Um, I think there are several levels on which forced labor needs to be tackled. And I think that's that's a, a strong priority. And finally, I very much do believe that the it is not at all appropriate to hold the upcoming Winter Olympics in, in Beijing. I agree with you wholeheartedly on that. Um, I just recently put out a report for Heritage calling on the U.S. government to issue an atrocity determination saying whether genocide and crimes against humanity are taking place. And it also echoes your recommendations on the Olympics. Thank you, Adrian, for giving our listeners a better understanding of what's taking place in Xinjiang. This is a crisis that deserves attention from people all over the globe. We need more people to serve as well-reasoned voices for the voiceless, just as you have done today. And thank you to our listeners for tuning in to our inaugural episode of China Uncovered, a podcast dedicated to pulling back the veil on the activities of the Chinese Communist Party. Stay tuned. Two weeks from now, we will bring you another episode of China Uncovered, where we will discuss the need for transparency in the Chinese government's economic activities and investments. Subscribe to China Uncovered on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you enjoyed this show, please be sure to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We hope to see you next time. China Uncovered is brought to you by more than half a million members of the Heritage Foundation. Sound designed by Lauren Evans, Mark Guiney, and John Pop.